AATCM, the Emergency Medicine Channel. Today we'll be discussing a case of a young adult who presented to ER with uh, complaints of acute onset of breathing difficulty. So we have a 24-year-old male who presented to our ED with symptoms of four days onset of acute breathing difficulty along with dry cough and intermittent retrosternal pleuritic chest pain. We knew it was pleuritic because patient every time he inhaled, inspired, patient's pain exacerbated. Okay. So that's why we knew it was a pleuritic chest pain. Otherwise, major complaints were breathing difficulty, dry cough and chest pain. So in our initial 10 second assessment, patient was conscious oriented and obeying to our commands. Then primary survey wise, airway appeared patent. Patient was able to talk in one full complete sentence. There was no increased pooling of saliva, secretions or any anatomical deformity noted. There was no change in the voice, grunting or strider also noted. So at this point in time, all we did was we placed the patient in a propped up comfortable position. So Why you keep all these patients in propped up position? That is very important. Why we are keeping this all patients who is having breathlessness in propped up position? In ortho, the, the lung reserves will be... Hmm. Basically, when the patient is lying down supine, the posterior segment of the chest can get compressed against the hard surface. So, so when it will not expand. Uh, so, the, when we have propped up position, the, the lung reserve increases. Increases. So, the patient will have more alveoli opening up okay. and patient will be in a more comfortable position. Okay. When you are standing up, how, how the patient uh, should be pushed? Sorry. When you are making the patient sit up. What is the what what are, what other things you have to give to the patient to uh, help the patient? That little propped up. The... Propped up position is one. Uh, then propped up position is one. Uh, then you give a cardiac table. What is that cardiac table? Uh, to support the to support. What what is the need of that support? The lungs expand. No, it it helps your shoulder. shoulder. So the, you know you learned about bucket handle movement uh, in your physiology. So one is movement like this. Other one is movement like this. So this uh, shoulder muscles help the uh, upper part of the lung to expand upwards. Okay. And if you are resting, the other side like AP diameter increases. will increase like this. That's why we always, we have to give that cardiac table. That is, that is the importance of cardiac table, not to give food. Okay. Okay. <laughs> So now moving on to the breathing part, patient's air entry was bilaterally equal, but patient was tachypneic with MMRC grade 2, chest movements were bilaterally symmetrical, but there was no usage of accessory muscles, no acute respiratory distress noted, no added sounds upon auscultation except for minimal scattered crepitations. Okay. Respiratory rate was 36 cycle per minute with regular rhythm and breathing pattern was also normal. But he was only maintaining a saturation of about 91% on room air. So at this okay. point in time, we gave the patient 2 liters of oxygen via nasal prongs and it was to achieve a saturation of... More than okay, 95%. Why you give only 2 liters? Do you really think that 2 liters of oxygen will help this patient? Actually, the thing is to maintain a saturation of more than 95%, sir. Okay. So, we just, in nasal prongs, the maximum that you can give is 4 liters. So, hmm. when we increased it within 2 to 3 liters itself, he was maintaining a saturation of 95%. So, what so, is your target here? Whether this uh, respiratory rate should come down or the saturation should increase? What is the ultimate tra target? Oh, we were thinking that the saturation drop, patient was hypoxic, possibly, which is why his respiratory rate has increased. So we just... No, no. What is the first response of any hypoxemia? See, hypo somebody develops hypoxemia, low saturation. What is the first response? First response is always... Tachypnea. Tachypnea. Okay. Uh. So tachypnea should be relieved. What is the problem if the patient becomes tachypneic for a long time in the emergency room? Respiratory so you are correcting the saturation to 95. That's okay. But if you don't see this, what happens? Respiratory? Fatigue, fatigue. sets okay. in. So slowly respiratory. he'll become uh, like distress. Uh, distress will increase. He'll PCO become more weak happens. and retention can happen. Slowly he'll go to respiratory arrest. That's so you have to always target this, this part. That is very important. That rate is very important. Okay. okay. So we started him on oxygen support. Okay. So, so don't start too little. That is a uh, very high. small. You st start high, then you reduce it. Ah. Okay. That okay. is the best uh, strategy in number okay. But only in COPD, like you told, uh, we have to give controlled oxygen and we have to just maintain about 84 or 90, in between 84 and 90. Okay. Then moving on to the next aspect, which was circulation. Patient had a heart rate of 98 beats per minute, which was regular in rhythm, mm -hmm. maintaining blood pressure of 120 over 80 mmHg and all peripheral pulses were palpable. So at this point in time, two large bore IV cannulas were placed. 
So disability wise, he had a full GCS score of E4, V5, M6 with the pupils of 2.5 mm, bilaterally symmetrical in size and reactive both to light. Mm. Exposure wise, he had a temperature of 98.8 degree Fahrenheit with a, maintaining a blood sugar levels of 124 milligram per deciliter. Oh. So here, since both the parameters were under normal limits, we did not really have any much of intervention to go about. Oh. So in our adjuncts, we took an arterial blood gas considering how the patient had respiratory distress and we found that the patient was mildly hypoxic when respiratory alkalosis was noted with a pH of 7.48 and a PCO2 washout of 30.4. Okay. Lactate levels however was normal and bicarbonate was uh, 24.2. Okay. But this was what was a little matter of concern. Hmm. But ECG had only sinus rhythm but there was no STT changes. Normally this type of changes where you get respiratory alkalosis, hypoxia, is type 1 respiratory failure. Okay. Where all you get all this uh, this type of patterns? Pneumonia patients when pneumonia uh, early phase of pneumonia uh, you can get then where there is no perfusion happening. Early phase of pneumonia, pneumonia. you get, but later phase you get uh, type two respiratory failure. Uh, uh, embolism. Pulmonary so embolism, embolism is the most important thing you have to consider here. Okay, mm -hmm. pulmonary embolism first diagnosis, second diagnosis can be any acute respiratory infection can be there. Third one will be anxiety. anxiety. Okay, but anxiety normally you don't get. Uh, PCO2 reduction, you always get PO2 reduction, PO2 increases. So, pulmonary embolism is the first thing you have to suspect. It can be even infection also. So, ECG was taken to rule out any sinus tachycardia or any uh, pericarditis features or any acute coronary syndrome, but nothing of that sort was noted. Only sinus okay. rhythm was there with no STT changes. Okay. So bedside quick ultrasound was done just to rule out any pneumothorax uh, um, and also a screening echo to see if there is any RARV dilatation, just mm. bedside ultrasound but okay. it was unremarkable. Okay. So we had unremarkable meaning, both the lung uh, parenchyma, we had we could see the lung sliding of the okay. pleural line. Okay. So there's no barcode sign on M mode. Now moving on to our secondary survey, patient uh, was presented with acute onset of breathing difficulty which last, started for about 3-4 to four days associated with only dry cough, no productive cough. And he also had intermittent non-radiating pleuritic chest pain which was of retrosternal origin, exacerbated during inspiration but otherwise he did not have much of any relieving factors. Okay. And uh, a few hours following the onset of symptoms, he also developed low grade fever. Uh, less than 100 degree Fahrenheit which only lasted for about a day. Mm. Otherwise his other signs of symptoms were, uh, he did not have much of signs and symptoms. But in negative history we specifically asked for any violent coughing, mm. violent vomiting, neck pain, lightheadedness, odynophagia, dysphagia, any neck swelling, foreign body ingestion, hemoptysis, any recent surgeries, trauma or recurrent respiratory tract infections. Okay. But he did not have any of these. Okay. Uh, so these were done to rule out any uh, esophageal rupture, tracheal rupture, uh, okay. Mallory V syndrome, Boerhaave syndrome. So or only after getting your complete diagnosis, this may be helpful. helpful. Uh -huh. So if you are suspecting pneumomediation, these things may be helpful. Uh -huh. So it's a routine case, we never take this much detailed history for somebody is having pleuritic chest, chest pain. pain. Okay. When pleuritic chest pain is somebody is having, then we have to ask history of one is infection, oh. fever or anything. What else? Pleuritic chest pain. Basically, it's irritation of the pleura. pulmonary embolism pulmonary should be ruled embolism. out. So, what history you have to take? Uh, immobilization. Immobilization. History. Any history of immobilization or history of long travel, Active high travel, cancer, oh. or any uh, if it's a female hormonal therapy, hormonal OCPs. Therapy. Okay. Oh. The analogic history, he did not seem to have any and medications, he was only taking these Ayurvedic multivitamin tablets which okay. is a complementary and alternative medicine treatment. Personal and uh, past history wise, he was a known case of bronchial asthma since childhood and he smoked only about 2-3 to three cigarette, cigarettes every day for about last 2 years. But uh, recently he had inhaled an opioid which is a heroin and uh, a day following this inhalation is when he his all his symptoms began okay, okay. so last meal was that day's morning breakfast at around 9 a.m okay. 
events so basically when this patient developed this acute onset of breathing difficulty he was taken to a nearby hospital wherein they just treated it as a upper respiratory tract infection considering how he was tachypneic and also had dry cough with pleuritic chest pain so he was conservatively managed with cough suppressants so albuterol. where will you give where all you give cough suppressant that is very important in emergency room uh, many of us we give uh, cough suppressants hemoptysis patients uh, most important is hemoptysis pleuritic chest pain uh-huh. then dry cough due to any origin uh, dry cough also can give but in patients who is having pneumonia is it a good choice uh, no mm-hmm. cough suppressants when we given uh, the uh, like infected get... sputum stays in so it and increases the infection okay. so we encourage patients to spit so out somebody is having sputum. pneumonia this is not a good choice somebody is having a respiratory tract infection this is not a good choice mm-hmm. but somebody is having pleuritic chest pain this is a very good choice okay yeah. then so albuterol nebulization which is a, a beta 2 agonist bronchodilator why, why we are giving this uh, that was given at a nearby hospital so because probably mm-hmm. patient for uh, since he was a known case of asthma okay. they had treated it as a, a bronchial asthma exacerbation which is why bronchodilator can you get a bronchial given. asthma without wheeze possible yes what is silent wheeze silent wheeze that's a severe, silent chest okay. silent chest. severe asthma severe asthma oh. and steroids were also given okay. with the background for bronchial asthma okay. but outside chest x ray did not reveal anything except for a normal parenchyma and so because this patient had persistent symptoms mm-hmm. they um, uh, they did this hrct chest which showed an isolated pneumomediastinum okay. but we did not have any films to back this diagnosis up so he was referred to our hospital with a running diagnosis of isolated pneumomediastinum but we do not have much of material okay. supporting okay. this so yeah so in our uh, clinical so any, assessment so in any clinical examination finding you can get in pneumomediastinum uh, pneumomediastinum on auscultation there is something called as a hamann sensor mm-hmm. which is a crunching sound you get during cystitis it will be something like a crepitation it uh, will be very difficult in a patient who is having a respiratory distress and rate of this much yes, uh, quantity we it will be difficult but that sign is explained as hamann sign hamann sign on the precordium during systole it increases a okay. crunching sound okay. so in our general physical examination we, it was relieved uh, revealed that the patient was a tall, tall and thin stature guy what is the importance of this uh, tall thin individual uh, so they are more predisposed to pneumomediastinum they are more predisposed Marfans to have bullies like marfan's habit habit habitus. habitat okay habitus Uh, so he had a body ma- mass index of 19.8 kg per meter square with moderately built and moderate nourishment was mm-hmm. provided so this patient did not have any pallor ictus clubbing not even cyanosis no so why are all, all students still moderately built and moderate right? most of the indians are well built and well nourished <laughs> but traditionally we all tell that moderately built and moderately nourished anyway continue another thing to do with the emergency room so uh, no pallor ictus or cyanosis noted so no edema too so systemic examination respiratory system wise he had a bilaterally equal air entry with symmetrically uh, rising chest with adequate chest excursion with a regular rhythm auscultation wise there was a scattered crepitations but it wasn't very profound otherwise no much of added sounds no subcutaneous emphysema neck veins were not distended and hamann sign was also not okay. present so okay. but rest of his systemic examination was unyielding unremarkable okay. moving on to the laboratory investigation wise uh, his routines were all normal except that he had a mildly elevated crp of 53.4 mg per uh, liter with a total counts of 14000 neutrophils of 80.2 so he had also some grade of infection but chest x- x-ray was not normal it was uh, uh, it, it showed bilateral uh, infiltrates okay heterogeneous infiltrates were there okay so with increased bronchovascular is he, is he a smoker he is a smoker how do you, two to three cigarettes how do you maybe? comment on this x-ray these are interesting it's a pa x-ray. view sir oh. uh, taken in in spir- mid expiration hmm. okay not full expiration so, plus oh. infiltrates okay and increased bronchovascular markings but no consolidation as such that's all so i can't huh? this no continuous diaphragm okay. so what you, what you are saying is you see this margin what happened to this area if you are reading an x-ray mm. what happened to this x-ray you don't you don't take take the ct first normally your heart has to finish here mm. heart border has to finish here mm. okay now what happened it has gone to this side mm. so that means some collapse is already there there is mm. diaphragmatic elevation mm. diaphragmatic elevation is there 
there is a collapse and you can see even this mediation upper mediation is turned to this side so there is some loss of lung volume is there okay so we don't know what it is but uh, these type of findings where you get i don't know what is a ct scan but if you get an x ray like this in exams Five. diaphragmatic hum where will you get pulmonary embolism it's a typical feature of pulmonary embolism but uh, it can happen in other conditions also even a collapse here can produce diaphragmatic elevation so but if you are getting a case in examination if you are getting an x ray like this Uh, acute onset of breathlessness, uh, pleuritic chest pain, diaphragmatic hump is there. Then uh, it has to be clinically diagnosed as suspected pulmonary embolism. But uh, after CT, may it may turn something else. So you have to be very careful when you are reading X-ray because uh, sometimes we get only X-ray. Okay. There is no evidence of any pneumothorax, okay. sir. And uh, generally, for pneumomediastinum, mm. uh, since there will be air that would have trickled, what happens is there will be diaphragm will be here, okay. and diaphragm also continues here. It's called okay. as a continuous diaphragm sign. Okay. So basically, the air gets trickled around the diaphragm. So okay. diaphragm appears as one single layer. Okay. It's called as uh, continuous diaphragm sign. Okay. And the other sign that we see is, if at all, it is around the Uh, aortic arch it is called as v sign of neclerio okay. and then um, it can go around so that is that would be like pneumopericardium okay. and then this is continuous sign okay. then in kids uh, th- thymus they'll have kids have thymus so that gets pushed upwards and outwards okay. so that also is called as spinnaker sign so okay. that would that would resemble a sail a uh, ship sail okay so this is this is how the thymus would have been pushed okay. so these would be the normal uh, abnormal signs that we find okay. and if at all pneumomediastinum is secondary to duodenal perforation then you also see air under the diaphragm yeah. okay. so these would be the normal signs that we see in a profound a typical case of pneumomediastinum okay. pneumopericardium or uh, continuous diaphragm sign v sign of neclerian all but this patient did not have any of any those of obvious these. signs okay. then other than that so since we did not have any films we went ahead with our md ct chest with contrast which showed extensive pneumomediastinum and free air along the neck spaces okay. tracking to the retropharyngeal space intermuscular plane of the neck but with no evidence of any perforation or uh, and uh, trachea and esophagus also appeared intact so no pneumothorax no pneumopericardium was also noted so we have a ct film here with us okay. as we see that this is the air that has trickled around the okay. retropharyngeal okay. spaces okay. and if it goes between the spinal uh, vertebra it is also called as pneumorachis okay. uh, if it goes around the heart it is pneumopericardium uh, but this patient did not have any of that is sort. there any history of fishbone uh, injury uh, to the Uh, yeah. that this patient did not have so but okay. if it was there's a fish bone it can rupture the esophagus and air can trickle okay. so but if the patient has especially if patients are alcoholic and they have continuous persistent retching malary we stare can also produce this okay. or boerhave syndrome anywhere the air trickles we have pneumomediastinum okay okay so this was the ct finding with all these air pockets okay. seen in the retropharyngeal space So with this we diagnose the case as a primary spontaneous uncomplicated pneumomediastinum primary because this patient did not seem to have any underlying lung parenchymal pathology okay. if a patient has an underlying lung pathology it becomes secondary spontaneous uh, pneumomediastinum uncomplicated only because patient did not have any further complications uh, no uh, uh, major vasculature is compressed no pneumopericardium was noted Uh, no air under the diaphragm which is why it was an uncomplicated and patient was hemodynamically stable also with a background of bronchial asthma and patient had possibly taken that would have been a trigger mm-hmm. his recent opioid use could sniffing, have uh, sniffing uh, sniffing sniffing uh-huh. heroin could have been a pot- potential trigger which has caused a sustained physical exertion mm-hmm. which has led to spontaneous pneumomediastinum now pneumomediastinum is of two kinds primary and secondary primary is like i mentioned without any underlying lung pathology so our management uh, went mostly it was treated as in conservatively with adequate rest because uh, again physical exertion can exacerbate it and analgesia was provided 
oral antibiotics does not have much of role to play here and high flow oxygen support was provided to the patient so this patient can be treated on an opd basis if patient does not have any complications and but if we are sending the patient back home we have to call the patient within 24 hours no need for a repeat x-ray but patient should uh, be unless there is any other further complications we don't really have to repeat any imaging but we also have to properly counsel the patient to not have any uh, to do those valsalva maneuvers or forced expiration maneuvers and spirometry the pulmonary function tests are actually contraindicated okay. and uh, his underlying asthma also has to be treated even niv should be contra like should not be given in this patient, in this patient. it can aggravate the problem, problem. Uh. normally we give niv for asthma copd and also Uh, in this case we have to be very careful so there is nothing much uh, no much uh, uh, evidence has been backed up to restrain air travel so this patient can have air travel also but these maneuvers and physical exertion uh, that requires that how, how does the oxygen helps in this patient it drives out the nitrogen uh, out of the lungs sir. so uh, pneumomediastinum basically patient's lung reserves expands and this air also trickles out we create a mediastinum has a um, more negative pressure so we give high flow oxygen uh, drive out the nitrogen and that's how that will get spontaneously healed so then um, in this case we only admitted the patient for 24 hours because he's a young adult and we just had to observe the patient but since his stay was uneventful we discharged him after a full recovery okay. and uh, reviewed the patient after about 48 hours just to see uh, if his symptoms has increased uh, uh, resolved or not how do you know so, that symptoms are resolved uh, basically in room air patient saturation picks up that is normal no? 19.1 hmm. uh, tachypnea uh, so most important is tachypnea what we can uh, very simple uh, thing we can monitor the patient only with this tachypnea alone okay. that will come down uh, so the take home message from this will be mostly this uh, um, diagnosis will be uh, either patient will be misdiagnosed or it will be missed uh, since the lung it will be just treated as a regular respiratory tract infection and the patient can be sent back home but it is important to rule out other dds like pneumothorax pulmonary embolism in these kind of patients okay. so uh, that's it so and then the patient was counseled to not use the iv drug Uh, IV is it IV drug or a uh, sniffing? Uh, he drug? he had both, sir. He both. had IV drug and inhalation. What is important? What, what is the uh, like uh, uh, dangerous uh, event which can produce uh, like uh, IV dr- IV drug abuse can produce? Heart ka. Which? ACS cocaine induced acute coronary syndrome. Cocaine okay, no, no, IV IV. IV. Infective and correct. In in infective. Cocaine endocardia. can produce tachycardia, ST elevation, MI, ah. acute coronary syndrome, all these things. IV drug abuse, any drug. Yeah. can produce infective endocarditis of which side right side right side okay so that also we have to advise him mm-hmm. so he may land up in another problem afterwards okay thank, thank you, you sir